And now it's time for the catch, which takes you around the Great Lakes to hear from reporters about the issues they're covering. Bite-sized news briefs about the lakes you love. At beaches along Lake Michigan, scientists are studying how well whitefish are surviving to adulthood in the Great Lakes. Kurt Williams is a journalist with Great Lakes Echo, and he dove into this topic for a recent story. Lake whitefish are a native species in the Great Lakes and uh, beloved by people who live in the region, uh, an economically important species and also keystone uh, species in the Great Lakes. And they currently are experiencing what is known in the world of fisheries biology as a recruitment problem, meaning that fewer young white fish are making it to adulthood. Kurt says invasive mussels are the likely culprit, specifically zebra and quagga mussels. And this has to do with their impact on the base of the food web in the Great Lakes. They're filtering out the phytoplankton that provides food to the zooplankton that is the food source for baby whitefish. In addition to the environmental impact, Kurt says this recruitment problem also has economic and cultural implications. Lake whitefish is the most commercially valuable fish for commercial fishermen, both non-tribal and tribal fishing communities. The impact on tribal fishing communities that were here for thousands of years, they've been using this uh, fish as an important food source and culturally as an important species in their lives. And it has, you know, profound implications for the continuation of that tradition for those folks. When it comes to combating invasive mussels, Kurt says that from his view, there's not much that can be done. I have seen stories about efforts to control them, but really I think that horse left the bar. There are hundreds of trillions, so, you know, I saw an estimate of, of peaks of at least 300 trillion quagga mussels with a T in Lake Michigan, Lake Huron. So they dominate the ecosystem. Kurt says that some species in the Great Lakes ecosystem are beginning to adapt to the mussels, and he's hopeful that things will balance out in the long run. Adult lake whitefish have started to feed on mussels. They're not as nutritionally, um, they're not a great food for lake whitefish. Another invasive species, the brown goby, feeds on quagga mussels and other fish, including lake whitefish, eat the round goby. So honestly, I think that, you know, any thoughts of trying to eradicate these invasive mussels, in, to my mind, is not a practical solution. And it's something that the lakes are gonna have to get used to. This is a new, a new member of the community. Kurt's story about whitefish recruitment is part of a five-piece series he did for Great Lakes Echo, looking at significant ecological changes that test our collective ability to manage the Great Lakes. In Toronto, a story of ecological resilience is taking shape at a former landfill that's now home to Tommy Thompson Park. Emma McIntosh is a reporter with the Narwhal and she's been covering the story. The fact that it is a park at all is a complete accident, but over the years, it's turned into a really, really important area for a ton of biodiversity, but especially for birds. This place hasn't always been a haven for wildlife, though. After decades of industrial dumping, Emma says that by the early 20th century, the area was a smelly and polluted dump and was later filled in. At one point, Toronto was expecting a shipping boom from the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway. And so it started constructing this breakwater in the outer harbor. And it would uh, they would have crews dumping truckfuls and truckfuls of rubble and stuff from demolition sites to basically fill in the lake and, and make a little spit of land. But that shipping boom that they were expecting never materialized and they didn't need the breakwater after all. So a couple decades went by and in the meantime, nature started to move in. Eventually, officials decided to turn it into a public space. Today, Tommy Thompson has walking and cycling paths. It's a really popular place for people in the city to visit year round uh, because it's so close and it has such a, a rich, a variety of nature. It's this great public access, wild place. Emma points out that Tommy Thompson Park has also become an important bird habitat and hub for banding birds. That's a technique used by conservation scientists to help track the health of specific bird species during migration. This helps researchers across North America keep track of where bird populations are going, which is really important because bird populations are on the decline here. And because their ranges are so enormous, scientists don't always know where the problem is. So banding them here helps researchers everywhere 
know more about what's going on in their lives and helps us dissect the mystery of what's causing their decline. Some of the things that staff at Tommy Thompson have done are really setting a guideline for everywhere else. Even uh, the way that they manage some birds uh, versus others is like precedent setting stuff. In Michigan's Upper Peninsula at Fayette Historic State Park, limestone cliffs are home to some of the oldest trees in eastern North America. During a work trip with some colleagues, MLive environment reporter Garrett Ellison recently learned of the ancient white cedars. We had no idea when we got there that we were going to be stumbling across Michigan's oldest trees. Um, you, you know, we did walked into the visitor center center and saw a display that says some of the trees on the cliffs here are believed to be 1400 years old and it was one of those like what no way i would know about that the trees were first discovered back in the 1990s by a group of scientists led by researcher doug larson who learned that despite the modest size of the trees they had been growing out of the cliffs for more than a thousand years these trees are not impressive looking, but they are very, very old. And it's because of the environment that they grow in and the unique nature and the way that the tree grows. It has these roots, which are hydraulically separated and unique to different sections of the tree. So they're very, very slow growing and parts of the tree can die. And you know, the rest of the tree continues to grow, it survives. And so they can survive in harsh environments, in rock falls and things of that nature. The age of the cedars was calculated through a scientific technique called dendrochronology, which also reveals centuries of data about the region's climate history, recorded in the width and chemical makeup of the tree's growth rings. What they're doing is they're core sampling the tree and measuring and estimating it that way. We want to protect these trees. They're a, they're a natural, amazing natural feature of Michigan. Amazing as these trees are, they're one of the region's best kept secrets. Part of the reason that they're not more well known is because they're somewhat inaccessible. The limestone cliffs at Fayette Historic State Park are closed off to the public. But if you're willing to work for it, you can still glimpse these ancient cliff dwellers by taking a boat or kayak out onto Lake Michigan. Bring a camera with a long lens and look up. And in the words of Doug Larson, the researcher who I interviewed said, you'll see an ecosystem and a habitat that's been staring out at Lake Michigan for the last thousand years. Thanks for watching. For more on these stories and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes.